in uh, Côte d'Ivoire, Ivory Coast. And I was watching a teacher teaching a group of nine, eight and nine year old children. And it was fascinating because they had been learning about wild animals and domestic animals. And the teacher, I like the, the idea that the teacher had, the teacher had defined domestic animals as ones you see very frequently and wild animals as ones you don't see very often. <laughs> Which in Africa, <laughs> threw up a few very interesting domestic animals, like elephants, suddenly became domestic. Yeah? And what the teacher was doing was the teacher was standing with their back to the class, writing on the board the names of animals, and the children had to shout, wild, or domestic. So the teacher wrote, dog, and the children wrote, domestic. And the teacher went, good. Lion. Wild. Yeah. And remember, the teachers got their back like that. And in the back, far back corner was the door to the classroom. And the door opened and in came the headmaster. <laughs> and the teacher turned around and went, headmaster. <laughs> and the children went, wild. <laughs> At which point I fell off my chair. <laughs> I rolled around the floor laughing my head off because I just thought this was brilliant, yeah? So, as teachers, don't classify things because your students will make you look like an idiot if you're not there. Yeah? Okay? Right, thank you very much. I hope it was useful. And try and pick out the, the key features, the key points for you uh, from the session, okay? Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much, Adrian, for your lively presentation. Please, may I have your attention? Could you remain seated on the chair, please, for a second? Uh, would you kindly be grateful if you could kindly fill out the evaluation sheet? And when you leave the room, there's a small box over there where you can leave the sheet. Huh? Otherwise, you'll be checked in. So, okay. Thank you very much for the afternoon session. At the end of the afternoon session, you'll find an evaluation sheet on the chair. Please, when we finish with our next speaker, uh, kindly fill it in and leave it in the box over there at the back, okay? Right. Um, our next speaker will be looking at how children can be helped in learning the language needed for a variety of scaffolding techniques. And how teachers can learn, can make learning both fun and natural, and how using English doesn't need to be an obstacle. Therefore, I would like to introduce you to Adrian Tennant, who will share some of his great experiences and thoughts with us, and I know you'll find his talk today very useful. Adrian Tennant holds the BA in Modern Art and Languages from the University of Kingston, UK. He also earned his master's degree in TFL from Sheffield University. And he's a teacher trainer who has had extensive experience in designing and delivering teacher training courses in many countries throughout the world, such as uh, he's been in the Middle East, uh, Latin America, Asia, many countries across Europe, and so on. Even though his first teacher job and so was in Las Palmas in the Canary Islands. Right. Additionally, Mr. Tennant has also worked for the British Council in different institutions like Cambridge, Macmillan, etc. And in October 2009, he was the consultant of the Classroom Language Project of the British Council, adapting the training materials to China. He's a top ELT author, and many of his articles and resources can be found in One Stop English. Currently, he now lives in Nottingham and divides his time between writing, teaching, and running teacher training courses, workshops, and conference presentations around the world. It must be said that he describes himself as eclectic, motivated, adventurous, driven, and tiring. Welcome again, Adrian Tennant. Thank you. This is going to be a very in interactive talk, which um, I, I always do. I do see
things called talk shops. I used to call them workshops, but talk shops is better. So talk shops, you talk, I shop. It's a kind of idea. Okay? And I think actually at this time of the afternoon it's probably good that I'm going to get you to activate yourselves from do things because you're probably fairly sleepy. Yeah. Um, <coughs> so we'll start. I've got two pieces of paper here. It, it was one piece that I folded in half and tore in half, okay? Um, which reminds me, this is the next slide. So, oh, it's this one here. Yeah. Ha, there you go. Okay, so this was half a piece of paper, I folded it and tore it in half. Okay, so which of these pieces of paper weighs the most? The same. The same. The one that's written on weighs more. <laughs> I don't think so, yeah? They should be the same weight, yeah? Because it's, they're the same size. Yeah. And they're from the same piece of paper, so they should be the same weight, yeah? So if I hold them at the same height, which one will hit the ground the fastest? Which one will be first to hit the ground? This one or this one? Same height? It depends on the air conditioning. <laughs> Do you think they all hit the ground at the same time? Yeah? Yeah? Yeah. 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 Okay. Great. Okay. Which piece weighs more? will hit the ground first. This one. But they weigh the same. And last time they hit the ground the same. What's different? Ah. Okay. Which one hit the ground first? Why? Why does it have less resistance? <laughs> okay, don't worry, you don't have to know anything about science. Okay? You were very good because you said they weigh the same. Often, I try this with lots of teachers around the world, and they say, well, this one weighs more. <laughs> How? Well, it hits the ground first. So it must be heavier. How can it be heavier? Yeah? This is a way of getting the children, or getting your students, to think. Um, one of the things you've probably come across a lot is uh, discussions about, um, what's it called? Um, critical, critical thinking, yeah? How important critical thinking is. I think, actually, critical thinking isn't important unless the children have thinking first. <laughs> so, so let's not jump to critical thinking before we've done some thinking. Yeah? So getting your students engaged and thinking about things and discussing why, they don't have to know the scientific reasons behind things, they can just hypothesize, um, leading off manners, getting them to, to work together and discuss and think about the different reasons, the different, different possibilities of why things happen and the way they happen. So this is going to be an interactive talk. The talk is language, it's kids play. It's a, a play on a play on words, a play on a play on a play on words because Child's play means things are easy. 
Um, I always think it's better to show, to do, rather than to tell. Um, I was talking to John earlier about an experience I had in China last year. I'd just done a five-day course for teachers on using English in the classroom. And then I walked past the room where they had a Chinese expert talking to them in Chinese about using English in the classroom. <laughs> and I said, why is he using Chinese to tell them to use English? And the, the person next to me said, ah, because the teacher's English might not be good enough to understand. <laughs> and I said, that's exactly what the teachers say about their students <laughs> and why they don't use English. Yeah? Um, we're going to look at language prompts, at scaffolding, at um, frameworks for getting your children to construct uh, language and to actually articulate more. Um, letting kids think is not about critical thinking, it's just about thinking. Um, and there will be more of these points as we go along. There's going to be two slots as well of question and answers. So if you have any questions, there will be a slot halfway through to ask questions, to discuss things, and so on, and a question and answer session towards the end. Okay, let me have a, a very first. Which glass can I use? <laughs> All of them. So I can do an experiment and see which one. You have to be very careful, I did it all once in Ukraine, when I poured a glass of water and then I drank it and it was vodka. <laughs> <laughs> it looked the same, and it's in a bottle like that, you know. So. <laughs> okay. Um, children. Children think. Even, even very little children can think. But we shouldn't expect them to think like us. They're not mini adults. <laughs> um, it really annoys me when I'm talking to some somebody, a, a teacher, and they'll say, "Oh, my, they, these children are very naughty. They, they don't behave properly. Why not? They don't sit still. Okay. How old are they? Eight. Hmm. Well, when I was eight, I didn't sit still. You know. They're not mini adults. They're they're children in their own right." Um, have any of you, you come across something called divergent thinking? Divergent thinking. Um, let me give you an example.
Okay, so how many different uses of a straw could you think of? Ten? Eleven? Okay, so this is a demonstration of divergent thinking. Unfortunately, you failed the test because you've only come up with ten or eleven. A divergent thinker in that time would come up with somewhere in the region of 150 to 200. <laughs> in about 30 seconds. 30, 30 seconds to a minute, yeah. Okay. Um, a divergent thinker, somebody of the level of di divergent thinking of Einstein. Okay. And you're all going to say, yeah, but I'm an Einstein. Okay. A divergent thinker will look at that straw and think, okay, if that straw was 20 metres long and made of rubber, what could I do with it? So they wouldn't just think about the straw as it is, they would think beyond that, that straw. What would it be if it was made of glass? What would it be if it was made of... So they would hypothesise all the different potentials they could get from different structures, different materials, different lengths, different, and so on. Now, there was a longitudinal study done uh, going back almost 30 years ago now in the USA, which was very, very interesting, because what they did was they tested children on children's ability to be divergent thinkers. And they started off with a group of children between the ages of two and five. Okay, two to five year old children. What percentage of two to five year old children do you think are divergent thinkers? Okay, it was 98%. 98% of two to five year olds are divergent thinkers, at genius level divergent thinkers. Okay, now it was a longitudinal study. So what they did was Five years later, they tested the same children. So now the children were aged between 7 and 10. What percentage of 7 to 10 year old children do you think were divergent thinkers? Okay, it had gone down to around 65%. 65 to 70%. Okay. As I said, longitudinal. So five years later, they studied the same kids again, now aged between 12 and 15 years old. What percentage of 12 to 15 year olds do you think were divergent thinkers? Okay, it was 22%. 22%. Now, the only thing that those children had had in common between the age of 2 to 5 and 13 to 15 was they had all been educated. Yeah. <laughs> they had all gone through a school system. So the school system took away their ability to be divergent thinkers because they were told that the answer is at the back of the book and don't look, that's cheating. <laughs> okay? So they were taught that there is an answer, one answer to something, rather than thinking across the, the board. So one of the things I think that we need to be teaching our children to, to do is to be, we need to enhance their divergent thinking skills, not, not limit them. So, um, we're now going to try an experiment. I'm going to play <coughs> some sounds to you of some animals. And what I'd like you to do is listen and then with your partner quickly discuss and write down which animal you think the sound is. Okay? So, this is going to be fun. We're starting with...
stuff in your palm. Here's the second one. Two more to go. Okay. I should have learned to read. I can't even read the names of the animals. And they've got pictures. Okay. 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 Okay.
Um, okay, so the chimpanzee was the which number was chimpanzee? Seven. 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 Yeah. Okay. Which one was the tiger? Two. Two. <coughs> Second. <coughs> um, the elephant. Third one, yeah. The fourth one. The fourth one was the hippo. Okay. Um, have any of you heard of hippo? Hippos, hippos are very, very scary. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was staying in a hotel in Bamako in Mali, before, before the troubles. I tend to go somewhere and after I leave, there's trouble. Tension. I went to Ukraine just as they had a revolution. But that was, they, they, they timed it incorrectly. I should have been there before they had. Um, and in the morning, I woke up the first morning, and I couldn't, I was like, what's that noise? And it was hippos in the river. Yeah. And they are so loud. Yeah. Yeah. They have, I mean, if you think of birds in, in, at dawn, hippos at dawn, ten times worse. Yeah. Yeah. And if they fly at dawn, that really would be bad, yeah? Okay. Fifth one was frog. Sixth one? Dog, yeah. Seventh one? The chimp, yeah. So the last one, oh, actually they're whales. They're beluga, beluga whales. And you know, you can buy that, you can buy whale music, can't you? On CDs, you can buy CDs with whale music that's meant to be relaxing. That's relaxing? That's why I don't do yoga. <laughs> okay, so huh. I now need eight volunteers. So, can I ask you to volunteer? <laughs> and can I ask you to volunteer? Can I ask you to volunteer? Can you volunteer? This is what the word volunteer means. <laughs> okay. A few years ago, I, a few years ago, one of my publishers asked. They said, "We're doing a new dictionary. We want all the authors to write definitions of words to send to us." So I wrote, "Volunteer." Now, the person the teacher chooses, <laughs> and it didn't get in. So let's have volunteer. <coughs> I. the biggest, all the way down to the smallest. 
And can you help them? Are you are you happy with that? No. I was going to say I've got I've got a West Highland Terrier which is this big, and I tell you what, she was a lot bigger than my dog. Okay. Are you happy with that now? Yes. 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 Okay, so now you have to get into line again, but this time starting with the loudest down to the quietest. Can you help them? started barking, but for a year it hadn't barked. Didn't know it could, I don't think, yeah? yeah? Okay. It's quite difficult, isn't it, okay? Yeah. Yeah. Now, a line from this end to this end, the most dangerous to the least dangerous. dangerous. <laughs> You don't seem to have moved. Help me. Mosquito. Mosquito always goes from the smallest to the most dangerous. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Quite quickly. Um, hippos are, are definitely more dangerous than tigers. Yeah. Hippos kill more people in, Af in Africa than, than any of the other animals put together. It's mosquitoes, humans, hippos. <laughs> mosquitoes, humans, hippos, in that order. Yeah? And, you know, for example, monkeys don't, don't kill very many people unless they're flying. <laughs> so don't fly with a monkey is the answer to that. Yeah? Or with the hippo, that's really dangerous. Yeah? Okay, and one last order. From the most useful to the least useful. <laughs>
if we if we think about it, I mean, frogs, for example, can be very dangerous because they can be poisonous. Yes. Yeah. They can be very useful because you can get medicines from yeah. frogs. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. Sheep are very useful. Why? Because you can eat them. <laughs> Frog, I've eaten yeah. frog. You can eat whale. Yes. You can eat dog. Um, just imagine how many how many steaks you could get from hippo. Um, yes. Just because you can eat, I mean, apart from eating it, what use is a sheep? Cheese. Cheese. Yeah. I have yet to meet a sheep that makes cheese. That's a really clever sheep. If I, go, if I, if I go up into the Pyrenees, I'm going to find sheep that make cheese. That's, that's good. I will remember that when I when I do the the walk across Compostela, because at one point I'm going to do that walk right across to Compostela, and I'll have to eat cheese made by sheep. <laughs> okay, thank you. Missing articles. Articles aren't important. There's no difference between cold and a cold. Okay, articles are important. There you are. Okay, so, with your partner, could you complete the framework? Okay, so 
giving your students frameworks will enable them to then engage and think, okay, how can I use the language? Now, you can give them a framework which is much more open, much freer. Here's a framework. With your partner, could you generate three sentences? So I taught kindergarten for a year. Whew. <laughs> Never again. That was the hardest year of my life. Yeah. And I only had nine kids. <laughs> well, no, I didn't. I had eight kids because one of them was killed in the middle of a class by one of the other kids. <laughs> well, it, it looked like that was going to happen, yeah? So, though. I always think if you've got teenagers and you think teenagers are trouble, <laughs> kindergarten kids, no. <laughs> okay. So, question and answer. Let me give you two minutes quickly with the partner. Think if you've got any questions that you'd like to, or any, anything you'd like to say at the moment from what we've done, okay? Or if you've got any answers, that would be even better. <laughs> yeah, just quickly, two minutes, see if you can find if you've got anything you would like to find.
So, any any questions? This kind of exercise are like uh, what uh, some people call tasks, the tasks of living teaching or something like that. Um, yeah, they could be they could be classified as tasks. Um, I, <coughs> my feeling with, <coughs> with teaching, but my, my feeling with learning is that the people who learn and the way to get learning to happen is to engage. And too often children are not engaging. I mean, if we go back to Anna's slides, you've got the teacher coming up with a three or four line question and the response being yes. Yeah. What's going on there? Not a lot. Um, have any of you come across um, a set of stories? It's a, very, it's a very famous character called Nasruddin or Hoja. Nasruddin Hoja. Um, it's, it's prevalent in many uh, Islamic cultures. So for, from, from all the way across in West Africa, in places like Senegal, all the way across North Africa, all the way to uh, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Turkey, they've got these stories about this man, uh, Nasruddin. Nasruddin is, is classed as a wise fool, okay? a clever idiot. Okay? Um, and I've got lots and lots of Nasruddin stories, mostly linked to concepts or teaching. And one of them that I like is, um, Nasruddin has been asked to be a teacher. He has no experience of teaching at all, but the Ministry of Education in their wisdom have said, Nasruddin, you're very wise, could you be a teacher for us? And Nasruddin, being very helpful, says, of course. So the first day Nasruddin turns up to the class, to the school, and he stands in front of the students, and he sees all the students sitting there, and he says to them, do you know what I'm going to tell you today? And the students go, no. So Nasruddin stood at the door and he says, if you don't know what I'm going to tell you, why should I waste my time? <laughs> I'll tell you. Okay. The next day, Nasruddin comes, stands at the front of the class, says to the class, do you know what I'm going to tell you today? Yes. Now the class are pretty very tough, they've been thinking about this, and they say, yes! So Nasruddin walks to the door and he says, well if you know what I'm going to tell you, why should I waste my time to tell you? The third morning, oh, Nasruddin comes in and he stands in front of the class. And he, the, in the class, there's, there's students who weren't there last, the last lessons. There's even teachers at the back of the class. <laughs> yeah? Students from other classes. Yeah? Nasruddin stands there and he says, Do you know what I'm going to teach you today? Now, these students are really clever. Half of them say yes, and the other half say no. <laughs> Nasruddin walks to the door and he says, Those of you who said yes, Teach the ones who said no. <laughs> That's what learner autonomy is. If you didn't know what it was, you've read about learner autonomy, you've heard about it. Learner autonomy is about getting the students to teach each other. Yeah? Okay. So engaging, yeah, it's, they're tasks, but they're engaging tasks. Yeah? Engaging a level of cognition, at a level of um, thinking, and a level, hopefully, of some form of production. Okay? But if I go back... <coughs> students need a skeleton. They need a framework to be able to produce language. We can't expect them just to produce it without some kind of help without some kind of guidance. Okay. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Not yet. <laughs> okay. So let's move on and we'll move on to the question of content. 
How can we teach content? <laughs> and my answer to that is, how can't we teach content? Language without content is like a burger without the burger. <laughs> you just have the bun. Um, it's natural to have content. If you teach English or Spanish or whatever language without content, what you end up is teaching about the language instead of teaching the language. Okay? So content is going to be natural. It always amazes me when people say, ah, oh, Clil is this new thing, it's only been around for 20, 20, 25 years, and I'm thinking, no, I think that Aristotle probably used Clil in his classes. Yeah? He just didn't call it Clil. It's a label that goes on to something. If you look back at book, books that were, I, I collect old EFL books, and I've got books from the uh, 1890s. They're full of content. In fact, we're very good at primary level. The books seem to have more content than at secondary level. At secondary level, they start talking about grammar. At primary level, they talk about animals. So, content's always been there. Um, the key thing is having something that's meaningful and interesting for the kids. So, um, how many of, can I just check, how many of you are primary school teachers? Quite a lot. How many are secondary? Okay, so let's go, let's pitch this. Okay, nine-year-old children, okay? I'm thinking about nine-year-old kids. I'm going to give you four subjects, and I'm going to ask you to talk to people next to you or around you, two, swings, fours, doesn't matter, and to think of some content for each of these subjects. What content could you have? So the subjects are geography, geography, biology, physics, and history. Okay, so there are your four subjects. What content would be good for nine-year-old children? I'll give you three minutes to quickly come up with some ideas.
Um, okay. Just time really flies when you enjoy enjoying yourself. It's been an hour already. Yeah, You've got half an hour left, and I'm like, come on, you're halfway through. Oh. <laughs> what what topics did you come up with? What topics did you come up with geography? Mountains. 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 Climate? Yeah. Oh, climate is a difficult one nowadays. Yeah. Very difficult. Yeah, what, what, what climate do we talk about? <laughs> Biology? Animals? Habitats? Water cycle? I wonder whether the water cycle fits into geography, yeah. not biology. <laughs> okay. Physics? Energy? Flotation, right? Yeah. yeah, I mean, one reason I didn't put chemistry down here is because letting nine-year-olds near chemicals is not a good idea. <laughs> yeah. What about history? East. Bone. Apparently, our new education ministry in the UK has said that history has to be taught in the UK chronologically, which means by the time they get to nine, they'll be lucky if they're on the island. <laughs> yeah? Kids won't like history. Yeah? Yeah? My, my godfather used to teach in an inner city school in Liverpool. He used to teach teenagers, teenagers who were trouble teenagers, so they had been kicked out of most classes. And he was meant to teach them about the kings and queens of England. <laughs> And he knew it was going to be impossible. So what he did was he started by teaching them about Genghis Khan. Yeah. And Genghis Khan goes across killing people and <laughs> raping and pillaging. And, and these kids loved it. <laughs> <laughs> they thought this was great and history was great. And then he went on to the kings and queens of England. And he started with Henry VIII. <laughs> <laughs> subjects and thinking of topics and then from those topics you can generate language. The language always has to come out of the topics, not the other way around. Almost always we have a structural curriculum or syllabus that is imposed on our content curriculum and it has to be the other way around. We have to start with the content, what do we want the children to learn and then from that, look at what comes out of it. So if we've got animals, what comes out of animals? Ah, comparatives, superlatives, wonderful. Yeah? And it naturally comes out of that. This concept of a linear syllabus is, is baffling, beyond belief. How many of your students, how many of you, how many have you, I'm oh sorry, how many of you have taught the third person S to your students. <laughs> Anyone thought that? Yes. How many of you have successfully taught? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, there's an obvious reason for that, and the reason is that the third, the third person S is pointless. It has no communicative value whatsoever. He like swimming, works perfectly well. Yeah? Everybody understands, we're all happy, and we all, can all get on with our lives peacefully, you know, living without going, likes! <laughs> Unless we're an English teacher. <laughs> yes, that's out by this. Yeah? Yeah? Children learning English as their first language will not pick up first person S until they are six or seven years old. 
after they have passive, after they've got past perfect, after they've got third conditional, after they've got idioms, they get it really late. It's very easy to teach, but impossibly difficult to learn. So these linear ways. So if you if you get some language out of a topic and you think, oh, this is too difficult for my children, stop and think. It probably isn't. Because if it naturally comes out of the topic and the topic is right for the kids, then the language is right for the topic, then the language is right for the children. Yeah? They don't need to know what it is, they need to know how to use it to manipulate it. So, content is, it has, we have to have content. Do we have any science teachers here? Any, any science teachers? No? Okay. A few years ago I was teaching, I had a group of Basque teachers, uh, I was teaching in the UK, a uh, clue course, and I had a group of Basque teachers, and on that course we had two maths teachers and one science teacher. <laughs> very different. Yeah. Um, and a PE teacher. And we had one teacher who was very stressed. He was very stressed because he taught uh, philosophy in Basque <laughs> to 16 and 17 year olds. And now he was going to have to teach religion in English to 12 year olds. <laughs> And he didn't know which was the most stressful thing <laughs> <laughs> of all of that. Yeah. Okay. So no science teachers. Okay. Good. Can you have a look? There's some questions. Could you quickly discuss the questions with your partner? You can only really you can only really answer number one. some balloons and some drinking straws and she said what <laughs> nobody's ever asked for that before <laughs> so here we are okay so we've got a we've got a, a cup with a hole in the bottom standard drinking straw and a blown up balloon okay so I'm going to ask for a volunteer <laughs> I'm going to put the straw in the bottom then. Can you, you probably need to face that way because they've got the camera. <laughs> I always forget they've got a camera. Now I'm going to put that in there, like that. And what I'll let you do is blow so the balloon comes out. Spanish people 
don't have much breath, do they? Yeah? <laughs> Anyone else want to go? Does anyone? No. I'm not part of this experiment. I'm the teacher. Eh? Anyone else want to come? Okay, so could you answer the other four questions with your partner? Who you have the answers? Group of adults when they don't know, tell me why. Yeah. Whereas young kids start throwing ideas in there. Some of them are really absurd. Yeah. Maybe there isn't a little man in there pushing. <laughs> no, there's no little man in there. If we put a little man in there pushing, will that work? Yeah. <laughs> and so on. Right. What can you see? What kind of picture is this? Okay, so it comes from who do you think painted it? Cave, caveman. Yep. 
So, we might have a chart, and we might ask the children to think and write down answers. How did Stone Age people live? What was their home like? What were the household jobs? What was food, clothes, transport, art? And we get the kids to fill in the chart using their knowledge, using their ideas. And we can give them a completed chart, for example, like this. And then we ask them, how do people live today? And get them to complete the same chart for living today. Now, as language teachers, what grammar immediately hits you? <laughs> what grammar do you hear? Immediately hits you. What do what grammar do we use when we're talking about the past and the present? Where do people now where do people live now? In houses. And they oh. you see the grammar emerging from the content. It naturally comes out from that content without you having to do anything, without you having to teach about it, because it's there. It's inherent in the content that you've got. So grammar should naturally emerge, come out of your topics, rather than the topics being forced onto the grammar. Grammar is not a separate entity. It's not separate from language. It's part of it. So start with the topics and work to the grammar. Okay? I'm on a, a, a discussion group, and this morning a dis uh, somebody in Germany posted something saying, I'm packing a suitcase, I'm just going to Turkey, but before I go to, I'm, I'm looking for my socks, I've got to find my socks to put in the suitcase. But before I do that, I really have to talk about grammar and these grammar tests in the UK that the minister is introducing in the UK. The discussion has then gone on during the day. Um, Stephen Krashen has joined the discussion, a very, very famous name, and you go, oh, wow. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and I'm going to post tonight about socks and grammar, because I think it's important that we wear socks when we teach grammar. <laughs> <laughs> So, grammar should emerge from the, the topic. It should be natural. Okay. And you're going to do some classroom research about socks and grammar. Yeah. Okay, so. More on scaffolding. Scaffolding is natural. Here are six pictures from nature. Could you quickly identify what do you think those six pictures are? The first one is a giraffe. A leaf, a yeah. Spider's web, yep. Yeah. What about this one? It's a honeycomb. A honeycomb. From the bees, from a bee's nest. This is what the bees produce to put their honey in. Tree, trunk. Yeah, icicle. 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 Yeah, I can't really see that one. Okay, it's a it's a snake skin. The, 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 the snake. Okay. So, talking about scaffolding, what I want to you to think about is scaffolding is natural, it's part of nature, it comes out of natural processes. 
And they're the logical steps. So the children can start, and you can get them to write little texts about this. We started with, hmm, we did this, this happened, and we think this happened because. So, we started with a cup, a straw, and a balloon. We put the balloon in the cup, and we blew in the straw. The balloon didn't come out of the cup. Okay? So you're giving your students an opportunity to write down through a structured approach what they did, what happened, why they think it happened. Okay? And you're giving them, if they do, in schools they often do three sciences, chemistry, physics, biology, or do they do it integrated? In primary it's integrated, yeah? In secondary school, separate. Yeah? And these are natural, these are lang this is language that they would use naturally in these subjects. So you're borrowing something from another subject and tying it in. And if the teachers are teaching CLIL and they're trying to teach in English, this would also help them. Okay. Um, yeah. Check they can see. How many fingers am I holding up? Ten. Ten. Okay. So we're pretty safe. Okay. Um, could you come and stand? Sorry. Could you come and stand here? That's very good. I'll throw a blind spot you. Could you stand in the middle? Okay. Now we're going to check your senses. Which sense do you think is your best? Are you best at touch, smell, taste? Me. Yeah. <laughs> Smell. Smell? Yeah. Smell? Hearing no. Hearing no? No. Touching? No. Tasting? No. No, no. Not tasting. No, just no. tasting. <laughs> Which are your best? So do you want them to smell, touch, taste, mm. or listen, and try and tell you what it is? If it's touch, you can give them the object. If it's one of the others, you have to hold the object for them. It's safe. So, <laughs> you're going to 
taste it? And when you've tasted it, can you whisper what it is? Don't shout it out to her. Yeah. <laughs> Some a different sense. Maybe smell. <laughs> so what did what did they say? Chromosome 11 is like 20, 24,000, 25,000 genes long. And it's our, it's, it contains our smelling genes. And out of the 24, 25,000, we have 48 that actually work with our nose. And the rest are called junk DNA. They're rubbish. They don't do anything. Yeah? So our smell is probably pretty useless if you think that another animal with chromosome 11 will probably have 15,000 of those which will work. Yeah? So compared to an animal that uses smell, dogs for example. I think my dog has a much better sense of smell than I do. <laughs> but I'm not going to check it out. <laughs> The thing she smells, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> okay. So again, engaging your students in thinking and using the, the senses. So senses there. Quickly, with your partner, see 
People say to me, children now are very difficult to teach because their attention span is so short. Well, of course it is. Look at what's around them. TV screens, um, computer, internet, video. Right? A few years ago I was in Turkey and a teacher there was lovely. She said um, to her students, you're going to have a test, but in the test, if you'd like to, you can use your mobile phones. And one of the girls put her hand up and said, but miss, I've been doing that for two years. <laughs> yeah? So your students will be doing things that you think are innovative. They are already doing it. Yeah? If I go back to classifications, and you were classifying things in the loudest, the biggest, and so on. <coughs> let your children, let your students classify things. Don't, as a teacher, don't impose classification on, on something. I'll give you an example. Uh, class, this was a classroom in West Africa. 